Hi, thanks for joining us for this webinar. My name's Caroline Rance. I'm the climate campaigner here at Friends of the Earth Scotland. Uh, and the theme of this webinar is BEX as a false solution. So BEX is bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. And um, BEX has been uh, on the table in discussions at Climate Talks for a few years now. Um, but the reason that we're beginning to talk about BEX in Scotland and that we wanted to host this webinar is because um, Scotland is getting a new climate change law. There's a new climate bill which is going through the Scottish Parliament uh, as we speak. It will be finalised in the autumn and um, BEX has started coming up as part of that conversation as part of the way that we will reach our new targets under this climate law. So the Scottish Government have recently committed to a new long-term climate target of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2045 and the UK government have committed to a new long-term target of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Um, now both of these are too late as far as we're concerned um, but the problem that we want to focus on in this webinar is, uh, is about BEX as a means to reach those targets and BEX has been brought into the discussion by um, the UK Committee on Climate Change, who are the government's independent advisors, who very recently published uh, a report called Net Zero, the um, UK's contribution to stopping global warming. And in this report, they have advised that Scotland could be well placed as a nation to host BEX, um, that we could have up to 33% of the UK's bioenergy grown here um, and that Scotland is a good site for carbon capture and storage. And we have real serious concerns about this um, and we have serious concerns that it's now being talked about in Parliament. So just a couple of weeks ago, Rosanna Cunningham, who is the Cabinet Secretary for Environment and Climate Change in the SNP government here in Scotland, she stood up and spoke in the Scottish Parliament about BEX and about the fact that uh, Scotland is well placed uh, to be a leader across Europe um, in deploying this technology at large scale. So it's really time that we start to have these discussions about what BEX is, understanding the problems behind it, why it's not a real solution and talking about the solutions that we need to see instead. Um, so I'm really pleased that, uh, to be joined tonight by Kirtana Chandrasekharan, who is a programme coordinator for Friends of the Earth International. Um, Kirtana is going to give us a short presentation to begin with, and then she's going to pass on to Almuth Ernsting, who works for Biofuel Watch. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Kirtana now. Thanks. So, hello everybody. Um, yeah, welcome to this webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to get into BEX and why it's a problem. And what I'm going to do is actually give you a bit of a global overview about BEX, because obviously it's proposed not just as a technology here, but also in several other places uh, as far as, as a global solution, really. So I'm just, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey, actually, about what BEX means for how we look at climate change. Because I think for me, it says a lot about how we think about how we make the transition to a different system uh, as activists and NGOs, how we think about it, and the fact that we really need to have joined up thinking across the different crises that we are in. So that's poverty and inequality, climate, biodiversity, environment, hunger, uh, but also joined up thinking across solutions. Yeah, And, and uh, it's not necessarily more complicated to do it that way. In fact, it can sometimes be easier to do it that way. And BEX is kind of a red flag to show us why. Um, and, and certainly in FOI, we think there are solutions to a lot of the problems that we see joined up solutions. It just depends on how much we are willing to challenge the status quo of power dynamics and inequality, um, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, so BEX, um, there's, there's a lot to, of, context to be given to the BEX discussion. One, of course, is the issue of net zero. So I'm just going to talk a bit about that. So net zero um, is everywhere now. The IPCC talks about net zero and the Climate Change Committee talks on, about net zero. So it's obviously net is just the amount of uh, uh, emissions minus what we're able to sequester. Yeah, so it's the net balance of emissions. Now, the important thing to say is that the vast majority 
of all emission reductions pathways used by the IPCC and everybody else uh, to limit temperature rise to below two degrees and virtually all the pathways to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees rely on the use of what are called negative emissions technologies. So this is also called NET for short, so that's a bit confusing, but it's not the same as net zero, but it stands for negative emissions technologies. But what these things do is remove uh, carbon from the atmosphere. Um, so the situation that we're in now is that we have delayed action on climate change so much for so many decades that obviously the, the carbon budget that we have going forward now has been getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And now several experts will argue that it's virtually nothing, that we are like within 15 years, 10 years, 15 years of, of breaching uh, 1.5 degrees. So what, what a lot of uh, experts are now dealing with is the scenario that we actually urgently need both drastic and immediate emissions reductions, but also some form of sequestration to keep us below 1.5 degrees. So this is what they will tell you. Now, that, I'm just saying what is the, the, the logic um, for BEX. Um, so, there, but negative emissions technologies is a word that's used for many, many different types of things. So forests um, are very, very strong carbon sinks. Um, the way that we use our land can, be, can sequester carbon. Various ecosystems, peat bogs, marshlands, which we have in, in Scotland. So that there are ways, those are all carbon sequestration sinks. But you can also do negative emissions technologies through various so-called geoengineering techniques, yeah, which range from the most fantasy to fantastical. Um, but they they are on the table now. So bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BEX, is the most popular of these geoengineering techniques, and the one which almost all the pathways, actually all the pathways, virtually, um, rely on BEX to do negative emissions technologies. Yeah. So what is BEX? BEX is basically, like it says, if, if you've, any of you have ever heard of biofuels, so think of biofuels, but with carbon capture and storage. So it's basically the large scale intensive planting of biomass, crops and trees. Um, so you plant them and supposedly carbon is captured in the biomass by way of photosynthesis. Then you burn them for energy. And then again, you cap capture part of the carbon uh, as carbon capture and storage, or CCS, as you have it uh, in, in many places. So the net result basically is supposed to remove carbon from the atmosphere. So proponents of BEX obviously make it sound like a fantastic idea and also necessary to stop climate change. But both are nonsense um, for various reasons. So I think there are several things we, can look, we need to look at. One is how much we rely on BEX um, how much of this negative emissions we rely on to achieve uh, one point to stay within 1.52 degrees, how the removal is done and why the removal is done, why BEX is being proposed as a solution. Yeah. So at the moment, all the scenarios that use negative emissions technologies use it as an excuse to delay reductions. So all the, all the uh, net zero targets are now you know, way out into the future. Uh, so it's essentially kicking the can further down the road and expecting that our kids will somehow figure out how to do this negative emissions technologies because they don't exist at the moment. So the hope is that our kids are going to grow up and be super brilliant and figure out how to do this. And in fact, a lot of the scenarios expect that 60 to 80 percent of the carbon we emit will be removed in the later part of the century. That is 2050 to 2100. Yeah, and that's huge. So we basically keep emitting um, and then we figure out later how to remove it. So I'd, if maybe some of you were at the talk that um, Kevin Anderson did for Friends of the Earth um, on Saturday, but one of the things he said, which I think is very relevant to the next discussion, is that all that's happened in the IPCC projections and several and all, all the other expert projections on climate over the last 10 years is that they haven't reduced emissions, they've turned up the net dial. And this is what they've done. So just assuming we'll remove more and more and more carbon out of the atmosphere at some point in the future. Yeah. So they're basically making the promise that what we will be able to do is continue emitting as we want, take the 
carbon out of the atmosphere, which would allow us now to massively overshoot safe carbon budgets and still control the impacts, which is extremely dangerous. Because we know that uncontrolled emissions and temperature rise will cause massive impacts. And even if you're looking at the difference between 1.5 and 2, as we know, it's several million more people displaced, several million deaths. Um, and just for example, the species distribution um, on Earth, of life on Earth, is twice uh, the impacts that they face at a two degrees than 1.5, yeah? So and any small rise, is a, is a huge problem. It's obviously also completely unacceptable because the worst impacts will be felt by the people who did not cause the climate crisis. Yeah, and of course we know that 50% of emissions are by 10% of the population, 70% of emissions by 20%. So essentially BEX is about allowing these people to keep their power and lifestyles and the infrastructure which they by large own and profit from for a few decades till we face collapse in society, essentially. That's, that's really what it's all about. The other problem, obviously, that with, with relying on negative emissions is that we, have, we really don't know what um, the tipping points are going to look like. So it's obviously what we do know is that it's cumulative emissions in the atmosphere that lead to warming. So it's entirely possible that the tipping points will be reached and breached even before we can start, with, even before BEX is starting to be implemented. So we know, I mean, there, there are a lot of thresholds that people talk about, right? So it's like relating to sea ice melting, permafrost, the ability of oceans to store carbon, what's gonna happen to our forests. There's, there's a lot of research that forests will store less carbon with, with um, rising temperatures. So if we don't reduce now, it will lead to even more negative emissions being needed later. The last thing just to say about negative emissions is that other than the fact that the technologies don't exist, which Almuth will talk a lot more about, that the fact is, even in theory, the potential is much lower than what climate models count on. Yeah, so basically, we're locking ourselves into reliance on this technology um, and into an increasingly warmed world. The other thing that I think uh, is important to mention here is again, the kind of why we're looking at BEX which is basically um, what is also dangerous about it is that we lock ourselves into a path of reliance on large scale infrastructure uh, and increasing levels of inequality and poverty. So we can already see the rise of climate migrants of uh, huge levels of inequality, which are being, um, the gaps are widening because of climate change. And what we actually need to be doing now is changing our economic structures and social structures and financial structures so that we, so we, so we bridge that gap so that we can actually deal with the impacts of climate crisis and also deal with the climate crisis. But if looking, relying on negative emissions technologies basically means that you don't have to do that. Yeah, we can just keep going as we are with the 10% and the 1% uh, and the 99%. And at the point where we see ecological collapse, the vast majority of the population will be in a position that they absolutely cannot cope. So this is, um, this, this is gonna be a serious problem. So now, so that's all about, um, you know, how, how much we rely on negative emissions technologies. Um, the other thing to say is how the negative emissions technologies are done. Now, it, historically, a lot of the climate debate, including in the IPC, has been focused more on energy production. Yeah, not on, not on forests and how you deal with um, biomass and forests and trees, which from our point of view in FOI actually we would argue is a good thing because forests are not carbon. Yeah, uh, and once you start considering forests as carbon, you, it leads to very strange kind of policy decisions. Like for example, as we saw with uh, the red projects, reducing emissions from forest degradation and carbon markets. Um, Nevertheless, it, you can't move away from the fact that forests are extremely important to reducing global warming. So deforestation is responsible for about 10% of emissions. So land use change, which uh, again is relevant because most forests are um, then converted into agricultural plantations and you dig up the soil. Land use change is a quarter of emissions. Yeah. So um, before we get into the other you know, negative emissions technologies, it's important to talk about um, stopping deforestation, 
because very few of the climate models, even in the IPCC, pay attention to how we stop deforestation. Yeah, and stopping deforestation is like reducing emissions. So the more we do it now, the less that negative emissions technologies will be required later. So at the moment, um, forests, at, at the rate that they're being destroyed now, um, if you just, they, will, they store enough carbon to release something like three trillion tons of carbon dioxide if they're destroyed, but they also sequester carbon. So around a quarter of uh, carbon emissions that we add to the atmosphere are, sick, are removed by forests at the moment. Um, so we have now um, a lot more attention to the role of deforestation in the recent past. So we have something called the New York Declaration of Forests to half forest loss by 2020. So it's a bit of a nonsense because um, deforestation is rising. Uh, the Amazon in 2019, deforestation has risen for the first time in several years because of cattle ranching, soya, and agricultural commodities. But also because the New York Declaration uh, talks about helping the private sector goal of eliminating deforestation from the production of agricultural commodities like palm oil, soy, paper, and beef. Now, I don't know how you're supposed to eliminate deforestation from commodities that are completely reliant on requiring an X amount of land. So it's virtually impossible to do that. So they're not very serious about um, reducing deforestation. So that's um, the first thing to say about forests. Now, as far as negative emissions technologies go, like I said, there are several ways you can do it. Um, so the first thing that uh, can be talked about is forest and ecosystem restoration, which basically means that you allow um, degraded forests to regrow. Yeah, it's a very, very, very effective way of uh, protecting biodiversity, but also sequestering carbon. Um, the other thing you can do is what is called uh, reforestation. So it's a bit different because forest and ecosystem restoration essentially allows the same species that have been grown to grow their reforestation is for, for forests that are more degraded that um, you have to have to actively help the trees to grow and plant, but you use the same species and the same in the same kind of mosaics that you plant them. And that's also um, extremely effective as a climate mitigation um, and sequestration. The, there's also something called afforestation. Now afforestation basically is just planting trees. So you plant trees wherever you feel like planting them essentially. Um, and afforestation is most, almost all <coughs> forest experts, but even climate experts will tell you afforestation is a bad idea because it has extremely negative impacts on biodiversity. Planting trees where uh, they should not be planted or have not historically existed or are not suitable um, has bad impacts on biodiversity, but also that, for example, if they, if they um, degrade the soil, which they can do, for example, eucalyptus, uh, it can release more carbon uh, than they actually store. So climate policy, generally speaking, historically, and even now, has been used as an excuse to plant more monoculture tree plantations and other large-scale monocultures as another big industry for profit. Um, so a lot of the discussion about how we deal with uh, negative emissions technologies, restoration, reforestation, or afforestation, which will be monoculture tree plantations, and BEX, which is also monoculture tree plantations, is about who controls the natural resources in this era. So at the moment, we have mo most of the world's forests are largely in the hand of local communities and indigenous peoples who are fighting at considerable risk to their lives to stop deforestation for extractive projects, for um, land grabbing, yeah? And now, um, so a lot of the companies that are kind of perpetuating this are getting worse and worse and more negative press. But now, land grabbing comes with a green face. So a lot of projects that were intended to um, reduce emissions <clears throat> are what we call green grabbing because they rely on massive tracts, millions of hectares of forest land, um, which with, with you know, eviction of people quite violent towards local communities and indigenous people. So for example, just in India alone, last this year, the, um, two million indigenous people are being evicted from their forest. So they're trying to evict them. 
and why um, a lot of what is happening is in fact that forests are being destroyed in order to plant plantations um, because there's no difference between how people see forests and plantations in terms of how they're defined as forests at the UN level um, but also because a lot of the climate uh, policies allow plantations to be treated as forests. And I'll tell you one, just one of the ways in which there is, which is something called the Bond Challenge, which is a challenge to restore 350 million hectares of forests by 2030. So this is very much within the climate debate. The Bond Challenge is a climate challenge, essentially. Um, now, this could be done through ecosystem restoration, through reforestation, as I described, but almost half the area of the Bond Challenge across Brazil, India, and, and several countries that have signed up to it are going to become plantations, monoculture plantations of a single tree species. Yeah. 21% is agroforestry, which is fine, and about 30% is natural forests. Now, the difference in terms of emissions is really stark when you look at that. So if you actually restored natural forests over the whole 350 million hectares, you would remove approximately 42 billion tons of carbon. Yeah, if we did, um, if we had the current proportion of pledges for plantations, that's half of it, it would be 16 billion tons of carbon. And if we had monocultures across the whole area, it would be 1 billion tons of carbon that would be sequestered. Yeah, so you can just see, I'm telling, I'm, I mean, the reason why the bond challenge is interesting is because it is a challenge to actually um, increase forest cover or you could argue, you know, I'm sure proponents of BEX will argue that BEX is doing the same thing, but in the end they will become, they will be about monoculture tree plantations, yeah, which are extremely dangerous and come with a whole host of um, their own environmental problems, of which some of them, um, of BEX style plantations, are extremely high use of chemicals. So pesticides and fertilizers, it's like any kind of monoculture agriculture crop. Um, fertilizers obviously emit nitrous oxide, which has 300 times the global warming potential of carbon. Um, and there are some estimates that if, if large scale BEX is deployed, um, just the fertilizer use on BEX plantations would offset the carbon emissions, so would offset the carbon reductions. Yeah, so this is the kind of situation that we're facing with what monocultures are really about. Apart from just the carbon, monocultures are, have huge problems of depleting water sources, increase uh, the risks of forest fires. Um, so there are some estimates that BEX would need double the amount of irrigation that food production currently needs. And currently, 70% of fresh water is used, to, is used for food production. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the, the, just, just the fact that just the monoculture tree plantations come with a whole host of problems. Genetically modified trees um, are quite, um, are used in plantations all over the world. And obviously with, there's land grabbing and evictions and violence, yeah. So, um, I mean, just at the moment, so about 1.6 billion people in the world rely on forests about 60 million indigenous people who are entirely dependent on forests for livelihoods, foods, medicine, building material, and also it's their home and they have rights that, that need to be protected. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, this is just the problems with the monoculture part of BEX. So it kind of falls down at the first hurdle. Um, but the other issue, the big issue is where are you gonna get the land from? So all the estimates of the level at which BEX needs to be deployed, deployed globally. Uh, and this is a like, massively variable estimates because nobody really knows um, how much is going to be needed, is between 100 to 3,000 million hectares of land. So that's anywhere between two and three areas, three times the area of all the cultivated land that exists at the moment in the world. Yeah, it's about three times the size of India or, I mean, or depending on, on where you go. So where is this land going to come from? That's the question. So there are several places where it could come from, assuming that we go ahead with this. <clears throat> one is um, land from food production. Yeah, so this is one of the first things that, that people worry about with the deployment of BECs. 
So already when we um, had the experience with the biofuel mandates in the European Union, increasing biofuels for um, use in, in cars, it, they did have an impact on global food prices. And this is kind of biofuels on steroids. It would be at that level if we're going to power really, I mean, they talk about powering aviation with biomass, half of our aviation with biomass. The Climate Change Committee is saying that. Um, so it would be absolutely huge. But again, I think the important thing to mention here is that not all food production is the same. And this is where we need to start unpicking really you know, um, some of the discourse around this. So industrial food production is a huge problem in itself. Yeah, 80% of deforestation is from industrial food production today. Yeah, and it produces, the industrial food system produces anywhere between 30 to 50% of emissions from deforestation, fossil fuel use, fertilizer, trade in food and refrigeration. And it's already responsible for the, this, it's responsible for evictions, for violence and for ecological collapse. Yeah, that's, that's one side of the, of the food system. But on the other side, um, already today, or still today, 70% of the world is fed by small scale producers who produce in local markets, who produce mostly ecologically, and these are the people that we need to really scale up and out if we are really going to address the ecological collapse that we find ourselves in. So there's a lot of good evidence that these, the people who, the small scale producers are able to address climate change, have vastly better performance on biodiversity, agricultural and otherwise, and feed people better. But of course, the chances are, if you expand BECs, it is these people who will be the first to go, not large scale food production or not industrial food production because they have very, very powerful agribusiness lobbies behind them. And two thirds of land now um, is under customary ownership with indigenous and forest peoples, meaning that people don't have titles, but it's customary uh, land titling. So it's very, very uh, susceptible and vulnerable to land grabbing by corporations because they don't have uh, legal backing. So that is something to think about. Yeah. So the, in any kind of situation where we look at like a climate stable future, we've got to massively change how we produce and consume food. Um, and that will be massively under threat from Bex. So in terms of in the UK, the, uh, the Committee on Climate Change report talks about a fifth of agricultural land that needs to be freed up for afforestation. Notice they say afforestation, which are monocultures biomass production, which are again monocultures for energy, pecs, and peatland restoration. So that's nice, but we can only guess how much land peatlands are going to get. And uh, Scotland, it says, could provide about 33% of the UK's bioenergy needs by 2050, 50% uh, of timber. And Scotland will deliver 22% of the total UK engineered removals. Yeah. Um, so that is, that is, I haven't done the numbers to see what this really looks like in terms of Scotland's land use, um, but it is something that needs to be done because that's, a, that is a vast amount of land that will be needed. Um, the other, the, so it just in terms of thinking, you know, about Scotland, I think there are some questions that we, that we would need to ask about the land use. Um, so I just, just, just very random, again, I haven't done the numbers. So if you assume that, say it's a fifth of Scotland's land. Yeah, that we take. So the most part of Scotland now is actually used for extensive cattle and um, livestock production. Um, so presumably, I think we could make a good guess that you would, they would ex replace extensive beet production with biomass. I don't see how else you would do it. Yeah. So that would mean a few things. You would mean uh, planting trees on grasslands, um, which would be monocultures with all the problems that we have. But the other problem is what happens then to beef consumption or meat consumption in Scotland? Yeah? So at the moment, we, ha we have this crazy system uh, in the UK, but everywhere where we, so in Scotland, for example, we export something like 20,000 tons of beef and import 10,000 tons of beef. We export 10,000 tons of sheep meat um, and import 8,000 tons from New Zealand. Yeah, and an even bigger issue is um, livestock feed, which the UK CCC doesn't even get into because it doesn't count as part of the life cycle emissions. 
but all livestock is fed on soya because they need high protein feed. And soya is one of the top three contributors with cattle and um, palm oil to global deforestation in the tropics. So if we're just going to replace beef production here with more imports, potentially it would have an even bigger impact on climate change, yeah? Um, so it's just an example of the questions that we need to ask because one of the things that we would need to do urgently uh, to address climate change is relocalize our food production. And this is kind of, will be going in the opposite, in the opposite direction. Um, so the UK CCC does talk about reducing meat consumption, um, but I would ask the question, if we did reduce meat consumption and we relocalized, what would we use the freed up land for? Yeah, would it be for restoration, for wildlife, or would it be for large scale monoculture planting of biomass so that we can still fly planes and um, use new energy? Um, okay, so that's the first thing. So it could come from food production or it could come from places identify, identified for forest restoration, which I already talked about. Or the third way, it could, the third place it could come from is from natural forests, yeah? Which would actually lead to more deforestation. Now, if that sounds crazy, um, we already have climate policy, so like red programs that are actually causing deforestation and planting of monocultures which then co companies apply for carbon credits. So it's entirely possible that it would happen. And you could very well imagine a situation. So say you have a mine um, in an indigenous area or in a forested area that you want to be carbon neutral. So you would like to power some of it with BEX. Yeah? Now, would you transport the biomass for the BEX from several miles away at a huge cost? Or would you just harvest it from around the mine? And this is, I mean, it's a very real example of what is likely to happen. Yeah, so it's there's all likelihood that bex would be planted in natural forests. Um, the, the just one of the problems, other than the climate dimension, is that of course the climate is not the only problem we're facing. Forests also hold seventy percent of all terrestrial biodiversity on Earth, and we had a recent report from the UN in May, the IPBES report that reported that we have a million species at risk, risk of extinction. Yeah, and some analysis have said that large-scale becks would reduce as many species as a 2.8 degree temperature rise. So this is very likely to happen, even if becks was not planted in, so in natural forest areas, it would most likely have impacts on secondary deforestation, what's called secondary deforestation. So if you have large-scale becks planted on an area that used to be cattle ranching, where would they move the cattle ranching into the forests? So we can already, there's already this situation now that we know whichever global commodity has the highest value tends to be, tends to go into forested land. Yeah. Um, so I think that's it. The last thing that I would like to say on this is that I think one of the problems with BEX is that, as I said in the beginning, it absolutely does not change the power dynamics. Yeah. It's another corporate controlled energy system. And one of the things that the Committee on Climate Change was super excited about, it looked like they were super excited about, is that they were looking at a carbon sequestration industry that's at least half as big as the current fossil fuel industry. So fossil fuel companies are delighted with BEX because it means they can keep, they can keep and build large infrastructure, keep building large infrastructure. They keep the power. Um, and the CCC report also talked about the need for governance and financial incentives for the sequestration in industry. So you would have more handouts, more subsidies for them to keep building the infrastructure. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to be said about it. There are some analysis that show <clears throat> that through CCS technology, it actually makes some of the, as they call stranded, um, stranded reserves of fossil fuels, it actually makes them, um, more profitable or it actually enables us to extract more with with ccs technology because you can pump carbon you know and and also it's more profitable to do that um yes so i think i i'm going to leave it at that i just the last thing i will say before i pass on to almuth is on the other side 
I think there is huge potential from good solutions to obviously we know reduce emissions, but also to do negative emissions technologies. So just from ecosystem and forest restoration, the estimate is that we can provide about 37% of the climate mitigation needed until 2030, yeah? Um, without any adverse effects on biodiversity and with likely very good benefits for biodiversity, yeah? So there are other analysis that show that if we do all the things that I mentioned, avoided deforestation, ecosystem restoration and reforestation, we could sequester 370 to 480 gigatons of carbon dioxide, which is basically one third of the pathway towards 1.5 degrees or half of the pathway to a two degree warming. Now, none of these uh, estimates look at soil carbon sequestration. Yeah, because soil carbon sequestration is extremely difficult to, um, to analyze. Uh, but soil carbon sequestration is mainly through better agricultural practices. And there are some estimates that show that they would again offset up to 30% of current global GHG emissions. Now, I'm not at all arguing that we should bring soil carbon into the climate space because I don't agree with that. But I think it's an example to show that climate is not the only thing. Yeah, there is a desperate need to change the way, for example, we produce our food for climate, but also for people. And a part of that would have the co-benefit of soil carbon sequestration anyway. Yeah, if we started doing more extensive, better types of livestock grazing, um, you could actually build, rebuild organic matter in the soil at very high rates. So I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, for the moment, and yeah, and I will pass on to Amut, who I think has a lot more to say about the uh, fantasy technology aspects of BEX. Yeah, I'm going to speak about uh, really the, the issues, you know, is BEX a real proposition or is it simply a sci-fi a sci-fi idea that is being thrown into climate models to legitimize um, uh, fossil fuel burning and large-scale biomass bioenergy burning. So uh, to start off with, uh, the, right now uh, Drugs uh, PLC, who uh, run the UK's biggest power station, claim to be developing the world, the Europe's, if not the world's first ever uh, power station project with bioenergy, uh, with BEX, bioenergy and carbon storage. Uh, so, uh, so uh, let's look at uh, what is actually involved in the so-called world first uh, BEX power project. Uh, first of all, I mean, some of you will be familiar with drugs uh, and may have seen the, uh, seen the power station when you drive, uh, take the train down to London. Um, Drux power station is uh, the biggest, single biggest source of carbon dioxide emissions in the UK also the biggest power station. It's the world's single biggest burner of wood. Drax uh, currently burns uh, significantly more wood every year than the total UK wood production annually. Uh, and virtually all of this is imported, majority from uh, North America. Uh, in addition, Drax burned 2 million tons of coal in 2018, con is continuing to burn, to burn coal this year too, and we fear in, in years to come. Uh, and it is planning to build the UK's biggest ever gas power capacity. It's got a planning application in right now. Uh, so that's Drax. Uh, looking at the biomass, where does the, um, you know, what, what are they actually burning? So the majority of the wood comes from, um, which all is imported, the majority from uh, North America and within North America, the vast majority comes from the Southern United States. Uh, now here are photos taken by um, an NGO called Dogwood Alliance um, that focuses on protect, trying to protect uh, southern US forests, such as the one in the top left corner. Uh, and uh, they're increasingly f seeing that uh, you know, one of the big growing drivers for forest destruction 
uh, in their region is uh, the pellet industry. Uh, this is a company called Enviva down below the pellet plant and in the top, um, top right corner, a, a clear cut uh, with the wood going to that pellet plant. And Enviva is uh, the single biggest supplier of drugs power station. Uh, so this is where much of that wood comes from. And I don't think I need to say why that is like really, really terrible, uh, you know, clear cutting forests like this, shipping the, you know, to, using fossil fuels to turn turn the wood into, into pellets, shipping them across the Atlantic and burning them in a power station at 38% efficiency. Why that is absolutely disastrous for the climate and obviously for forests and uh, the biodiversity, this is actually a global biodiversity hotspot uh, where the clear cutting is taking place. Uh, so, um, however, regardless of whether it is quite as bad as shown here or whether trees in plantation trees are being felled, um, the climate impacts uh, have been wi are widely considered by scientists to be you know, seriously adverse. So this is from an open letter signed by 800 scientists last year. Uh, who are all saying if forests are allowed to regrow using wood, even if forests are allowed to regrow, using wood deliberately harvested for burning will increase carbon in the atmosphere and warming for decades and centuries, as many studies have shown, even when wood replaces coal, oil, or natural gas. So, in the, yeah, the climate impacts of uh, cutting down forests or cutting down trees for burning are really, really bad and absolutely not an alternative, not, um, an acceptable alternative to a fossil fuel burning, unlike you wind solar wave power. Uh, so the question is, is, uh, is Drax actually piloting a first uh, ever power station uh, project or is it simply um, or is it simply greenwashing? It's you know very destructive uh, biomass activities. So what's involved in the so-called BEX project, which has been all over the media and won, you know, recently won a, a renewable energy prize in the northeast of England. So what they're actually doing, this is actually quite funny. Uh, so the whole idea was that they're testing, um, they, they, are test, they are testing a new solvent by a startup company. So solvents are used to capture CO2 and they've been solvents used to capture CO2 since the 1920s. So this company wants to find out whether whatever its novel solvent, and they haven't said what it actually is, uh, whatever that is, whether it works as well or better than stuff that's been around for the last 90 years, almost century, um, and using drugs power station to do that. The whole aim is to capture uh, a single ton of, um, a single, single ton of uh, CO2 out of the 47,000 tons of CO2 emitted by the power station every year. And bizarrely, Drax was planning to sell that tiny bit of CO2 to breweries to put fizz into beer, honest. Uh, but it hasn't actually worked. So the latest they said at the end of May was that the captured CO2 is just so um, so polluted with other stuff, uh, so impure that they're just releasing back to the atmosphere. So that's supposed to be bags, obviously not. Uh, so they now, with this clearly having been not a success, um, they've entered into the latest hugely hyped partnership with a weird new uh, biotech company uh, called Deep Branch Biotechnology, which is really all about, um, I mean, those are guys who've been uh, working at, at, at a university trying to genetically play around with genetically engineering um, blue-green algae. And uh, they are now trying to get funding for uh, trying to test out a way of um, using some of the the uh, CO2 rich flue gases from power stations or whatever else to uh, feed the algae, uh, put in some hydrogen, uh, put in some nutrients, and then hope that the algae produce some proteins. And then, you know, the whole fantasy goes the proteins are put into fish farms to feed the fish. And then, uh, where well, once we've eaten the fish from the fish farms, obviously, all that carbon captured is going to end up into the atmosphere again. Hugely challenging technology, never tested outside the laboratory. The company's totally new, never done anything really. 
uh, no, you know, they've got nothing, don't seem to have anything other than you no know, bunch of papers. And uh, yeah, and that's being sold as uh, by Bex, uh, by Bedrux as a new Bex technology. Uh, so what we're seeing is that, that what's happening in the power station sector is, you know, is simply hype. There's nothing else. And I would say there's nothing else, not just in the UK, but there's nothing else happening in the in the, on the whole planet. And we've been following this quite closely. There's not a single company. Otherwise, that's even testing anything relevant to BEX um, to do with power, with the power, power stations or combined heat and power or heat plants or whatever. Now, there is, I should say, as an exception, only one type of um, bioenergy with CO2 capture that is being done, that does work, and that is capturing the carbon dioxide from ethanol fermentation. So when, uh, as when cornstarch uh, corn or um, wheat starch, for example, are fermented to ethanol, uh, to ethanol uh, carbon dioxide, pu uh, pure carbon dioxide mixed with uh, water uh, are emitted. So you've got very, very pure, already pure CO2 stream and um, several refineries, mainly corn ethanol refineries, are, have been long capturing that stuff. Mostly they are selling it on for, um, uh, to, to put into fizzy drinks uh, or bicarbonate of soda. There's one single uh, refinery that's been pumping it into um, geological sandstone formation, getting uh, having had um, federal US uh, grants for that um, in, in, Illinois, in Illinois. Uh, and uh, yeah, they, that is now uh, being hyped as a BEX project. But in actual fact, even if, corn, even if you didn't need any land to grow the corn, even if you didn't have any land use change emissions, even if you didn't use fertilizers um, on a large scale to, to produce in that corn, uh, which cause greenhouse gas emissions, even then um, you would still have more carbon dioxide emitted from burning uh, gas to run a ref uh, an ethanol refinery like that than the entire amount of CO2 that's captured. So there's nothing remotely carbon negative in this. You know, there's more fossil fuel CO2 being emitted than the CO2 being captured. And that is it. That is, you know, that's very, very pure CO2. It's very easy to capture. And it's not BEX because it's not, uh, sec it can't, you know, it can't ever go carbon negative. And uh, there is simply nothing in the, in the, in the, powers, in the power and heat sector. Now, um, some a couple of years ago, uh, colleagues and I uh, wrote a report about uh, about very detailed report about Bex, um, the problems with uh, carbon capture and storage, looking at existing because there's no biomass plants existing. We looked very carefully at all the different coal. Uh, attempts to have coal power stations with CCS, all the difficulties, and we looked into um, the problems with carbon uh, sequestration, um, this is, um, the, the problems with, with leakage, uh, with cracks appearing uh, where they try to, to pump it into geological uh, formations. You can find that report if you search for BEX um, on, uh, on our Biofuel Watch website. Uh, very briefly, there are three reasons um, why the conclusions from the research we did, why we believe we're highly unlikely to see biomass plants with CCS ever happening. The first one is that the technologies involved are highly, highly complex. They are very prone to failure. Um, they are so prone to failure uh, that, by and large, you know that that virtually that there's no energy company planning any new coal uh, coal CCS project at the moment. The ones that had invested in experiments and attempts are, you know, they're, they're ending that. Uh, with back with biomass, it would be even more difficult with than with coal because there's zero experience and biomass combustion. The the properties and the problems with burning wood are very different to those. From burning with burning coal, uh, so we are decades further behind in the learning curve for bags, and nobody is. There is no learning curve. Nobody's doing it. Uh, secondly, and that is very much linked to the other two points. CCS is incredibly expensive. Now, as far as biomass is concerned, that right 
oh no, so <laughs> right now drugs needs 2.3 million or so, not billion, but 2.3 million every single day in subsidies uh, it is getting. And uh, it is needing those to simply stay out of the red uh, because uh, so, uh, the simply burning that much wood is incredibly expensive. Now, if you add BEX technology to it, you're gonna uh, multiply and hugely increase the expense. There is no way that even with even with generous subsidies that could be propped up ever on a, even on you know and on any larger scale. And finally, again linked to the you know which the, the expense is linked to, carbon capture and storage has a very very high energy penalty. And that's the last bit to, men, uh, to, to go into, and in some ways the biggest concern, if Bex was to ever work, is this energy penalty. Uh, so right now there is one, there is one calm capture storage coal unit in Canada uh, for which figures exist. Uh, it uses, has to use more than 30% of the energy of the of the power generated by the plant simply to capture and compress the CO2. Now, when you burn biomass for energy, you emit more CO2 per unit of energy than you do from coal. So that means you need even more energy to capture the, that CO2 because it's more CO2. So we're looking at something like at least one third of, um, you know, if drugs was to, which won't happen, if drugs was ever to run on, um, to run with bags, we would, they would need to burn one third more trees from logging. This is from Estonia. This is um, where a colleague and I actually took photos next to a pellet plant supplying drugs in Estonia. They would need one third more wood uh, to get the same already quite low amount of energy um, out of it than they do know now. So in other words, if Bex was to ever work, they'd be, we'd be needing to cut down more trees and convert more land to, uh, to plantations uh, for less energy. And that's why Bex isn't just something bad with CCS tagged onto it, uh, but it would actually uh, worsen existing, you know, existing problems. Um, in brief summary, you know, if BEX is included into Scottish Climate Bill or Scottish Climate Policy, the main thing is that, is, is that it would leave a big hole in climate targets. There is no realistic prospect of BEX ever being commercialized anywhere. If it was commercialized, it would lead to even more logging and land grabbing and convert land conversion for monoculture, tree, or maybe crop plantations at the expense of climate, biodiversity, and people. Uh, but most one of the most worrying things is that uh, Bex is uh, that the whole hype and debate about Bex is actually legitimizing on the one hand the, the increase in destructive high carbon biomass plants, and on the other hand legitimizing ongoing fossil fuel burning by pretending that we can emit today and scrub it out of the atmosphere tomorrow. Uh, so yeah, that's me. Thank you very much um, to both Alma Ernsting of Biofuel Watch and Kirtana Chandrasekharan of Friends of the Earth International. Um, that was a, a whistle-stop tour of all the absolutely awful things um, with, with Bex. Um, it's, it was quite alarming. Um, and it's very clear uh, from both Kirtana and Alma that Bex is absolutely not a climate solution, not here in Scotland and not around the world. Um, it, it allows us to continue business as usual by putting off any real action to cut emissions now by relying on this hope um, that we will be able to invent this technology and suck this carbon out of the atmosphere in years to come. And as Almuth uh, just put it really starkly there, it basically doesn't exist and it's not likely to. It, if it does, it won't deliver the carbon savings that are promised. Um, and as Kiyotina put it, it, it won't change who owns and controls our energy. It doesn't change the power dynamics um, around energy production. It, uh, it requires a huge amount of land. I was really struck by that, um, that statistic that it would require two to three times the area of all currently cultivated land in the world and in Scotland, uh, the UK Committee on Climate Change have said a fifth of all agricultural land uh, should be 
taken out of, of food production um, for bioenergy in BICS. And of course, as Keaton said, that has grave, grave consequences for people, um, particularly for people who are managing forests for indigenous people, um, that two million people evicted this year in India alone. Uh, lots of land grabbing, lots of consequences um, for people who are who are living off and relying on forests. And of course, um, all of the statistics about how awful monoculture plantations are, how deeply, deeply damaging that is for biodiversity um, and the additional consequences of the fertilizer use and the carbon consequences of the chemicals used. Um, so all in all, uh, it's really something that we're going to have to fight and it's coming up the agenda here in Scotland. Um, as I said previously, uh, the, the UK Committee on Climate Change has advised in their most recent report, their Net Zero report, that this could be a solution for Scotland and they're advocating that Scotland could produce up to 33% of, uh, of bioenergy in the UK and that our, uh, the, the sort of wells that we've had from extracting oil and gas in the North Sea, that those sites could be used uh, to, to basically to, to store that, that captured carbon in future. Um, so it's, it's deeply risky, uh, it's deeply unjust uh, and, it, and it doesn't exist. <laughs> Um, but we do have the solutions, and I think that's, um, that came across really clearly from Kirtan as well. We know what the answers are. Um, and in Scotland, we have this opportunity. The Climate Change Bill is going through the Parliament at the moment. Um, and then we need to start having these, these really serious discussions about how do we want to reach those targets? What is the fair, just, right way for people, for biodiversity, um, to meet those targets in a way that, that isn't harmful. Um, so we know that we urgently need to make those deep emissions reductions across society. That means cutting out fossil fuels from our energy mix. It means saying no to new oil and gas uh, exploration in the North Sea. It means tackling emissions from transport. It means tackling emissions from big industrial agriculture. As Kirtana was saying, the, the model of industrial agriculture and intensive food production is damaging in and of itself. So we need to tackle that. Um, and we have these natural climate solutions. So we have uh, a lot of degraded peatland in Scotland. We can do an awful lot to restore that peatland and that will um, that will be the natural climate solution to sequester carbon in Scotland and, uh, and forest restoration, as Kirtana was talking about. So um, I hope that that has given you an overview of of the problems and why we need to fight this and we are going to have to fight this um, and to be to be clear about what we want instead um, because this is absolutely not the answer. Um, if anyone wants to find out a bit more about the climate change bill uh, which is currently going through the parliament and the things that we're asking for within that bill um, then do have a look at the Friends of the Earth website which is uh, foe.scot um, do look up Biofuel Watch as well, and um, we'll put the links up alongside the recording um, and also Friends of the Earth International. Um, we'll put the links up uh, for all of those so that you can go and do any further reading if you want to.